Good day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this lecture three of the Cricket South Africa Level 1 umpiring course hosted by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Abdullah Stienkamp, and as usual, my co-host for this evening will be Thomas Mukarosi. The format of tonight's lecture will be as follows. I will kick off with laws 12, 13, and 14. I'll then hand over to Tom, who will cover laws 15, 16, and 17. After that, all cameras and microphones will be deactivated. We will then open the floor for our Q&A session. So to kick off this evening, law number 12 covers the start of play and the cessation of play. And again, I'll use um, a test match as an example that spans over five days where day one or all days will uh, will have a 10 o'clock start and a five o'clock uh, in. There are three sessions in the day of two hours each. So our first session will be from 10 till 12. We'll have a 40 minute lunch. Uh, second session will be from 12.40 till 14.40, 20 minute tea. And then our last session will be from three o'clock till uh, five o'clock. So let's use day one as an example. So play starts at 10 o'clock and we'll play through till lunch at 12 o'clock. So we'll, the fielding side will try to bowl as many overs in the two hour session. So practically what will happen is 10 o'clock play starts, five minutes before play is about to start, which is 9.55, the umpires will take the field. The umpires chose the ends uh, before um, play starts, so they'll go to their respective ends. Then the fielding side will then take the field, and after that, the batters will then take the field. Fielding side will then choose which side they're going to uh, uh, bowl from. Batters decide who's going to face the first ball. Umpires get in position. They'll make sure that there are 11 fielders on the field. They'll confirm with the scorers that they're ready. They'll then confirm with the batters that they're ready, and they'll double check with the fielding captain that he or she is ready. And, and the, the reason why we, we walk on five minutes before play starts is to make sure that at exactly 10 o'clock, the first ball gets bowled. So now everyone is in position, bowlers on at the top of his or run-up, and the play is now about to start. So just before the bowler starts, he's a run-up to commence the first over of the test match. Law tell us that the bowlers in umpire needs to call play to indicate the start of the match. Similarly, play also needs to be called by the bowlers in umpire. Once play resumes after the lunch or tea interval or after any inter interruption. So in our test match, so we now just covered before play starts, just as about the bowl is about to bowl um, or take his or first step to bowl the first over, bowlers in umpire needs to call play. Similarly, lunch will be at, let's say, at 12 o'clock, 12.40, the first ball needs to be bowled after lunch. Again, umpires will will take the field five minutes before. Uh, the first ball needs to be bowled. If, uh, umpires take the field, fielding side take the field, batters take the field. First ball then will be bowled at 12.40. And just before the the bowler begins his run-up to start play after lunch, bowler and umpire needs to call play. And that indicates that the session has now officially started. So now we've covered when the session starts, by the bowlers in umpire calling play. So when do the session ends? Umpire, bowlers in umpire now needs to call time. And that and the calling of time will indicate that the session is now at an end. 
So in our example with the uh, we with the call of play at ten o'clock, let's say the last ball of the over is bowled at exactly twelve o'clock. So once that final ball is bowled, and the law also tell us we need to wait till the ball is dead. And so as soon as that final ball is bowled, that your watch shows twelve o'clock, the ball is now dead. The bowlers in umpire then needs to call over time and lunch, and that indicates that it is now uh, lunch time. Similarly, bowlers in umpire needs to call time if there's you know, for any interruption and to call time at the conclusion of the match. So once time has been called, the law tells us that bales needs to be removed from both wickets. So practically how this happens, uh, let's use lunchtime as an example. Same principle uh, will apply for uh, for uh, for tea or at any time when time is called, but it did, let's just use lunchtime as an example. Lunch is at 12 o'clock, final ball gets pulled, you look at your watch, it's, uh, you see it's 12 o'clock. You now call over time and lunch. Law now tell us that as soon as you've called time, bales needs to be removed from both ends. So practically what will happen, the bowlers in umpire after calling time will walk towards the uh, the wickets and remove the bales. The strikers in umpire needs to do exactly the same, needs to remove the bales at the strikers end. So starting a new over, so I said earlier that uh, you get uh, in test match cricket, there are sessions of play during the day, uh, in test matches three sessions, so let's just use the first session as an, as an example, so you get, you get to, the first session is from 10 till 12, so you need to try to bowl as many overs between 10 and 12 o'clock. So now there are times where, let's say you get to 11.59. So do you start a new over or don't you start a new over, knowing that lunch is 12 o'clock? And, and, and obviously, uh, I haven't come across a bowler that bowls it over in one minute. I've seen bowlers bowl in two minutes. Uh, players like uh, the, Jade, uh, the Dades of India bowl two minutes over, overs, but there are many bowlers, but I haven't seen a one minute over. But let's just say, for example, purposes, your watch shows 11.59. So can you take lunch? No, you cannot take lunch because lunch, uh, lunch is only at 12 o'clock. But you know you're not going to complete the over before 12 o'clock. But what must you do? Law guides us. Law tells us what needs to happen. Another over needs to start. If the umpire walking at normal pace arrived at his or her position behind the stumps before the agreed time for, in our example, uh, lunch, if that is the case, a new over to be started. I use a I'll use a I'll use a practical example to illustrate what point number four is trying to tell us. So, uh, so at 11:59, the the six ball is bowled of that particular over. So now the umpire calls over. Look at his uh, look at his or what sees is 11:59. We know we cannot take lunch because it's not 12 o'clock yet. So now what needs to happen is umpires will now go uh, walk towards their positions. They need to walk at a normal pace. So what I mean by walking towards their position. So at the end of the over, what usually happens, the bowlers in umpire will now walk towards. Uh, to, um, towards the, the square, square leg side or the on side and the strikers in umpire will now move to um, to get into position behind the stumps at the bowler's end. So now law tell us you need to walk at normal pace, at your normal pace. You should not be running to get behind the stumps. So at your normal pace, the strikers in umpire will now start walking towards the stumps to try to get into a position behind the stumps at the bowler's end. If the strikers in umpire gets to behind the stumps before 12 o'clock, a new over to be started. 
So if the um, strikers and umpire do not get behind the stumps before 12 o'clock, over um, time and lunch will be called. So practically what happened, strikers and umpire will walk towards the stumps, looking at his or her watch. Again, walking at normal pace, should not be running, nor should uh, he or she be walking at um, a snail space. The, um, the normal pace, it will differ from umpire to umpire, but that umpire's normal pace. And if getting behind the stumps before 12 o'clock, a new over to be started. Completion of an over. Do we always complete uh, an over? Yes or no? The law guide us here. The law tell us, other than at the end of the game, if the agree time for the interval is, is reached during the over, you will not take the interval. You first need to complete the over. That's what law tell us. I'll use an example just to illustrate this point. But before I get to the example, there's one exception and we'll get to it. Uh, but the law tell us you need to complete the over before an interval is reached. Except the one exception, we'll get there next. To, I'll use an example to illustrate this. Our lunchtime is in 12 o'clock. It is now 11.59 and the third ball of the over is bowled. So you look at your watch, you see 11.59 third ball. Now they bowl the fourth ball and you look at your watch and you see now it's 12 o'clock. So we know we know lunch is 12 o'clock. So, but, uh, so, but they've only bowled four balls in the over. So do we, do we take lunch seeing that it's 12 o'clock? No. The law tell us you first need to complete that particular over. So the remaining two legal balls needs to be bowled or the over needs to be completed before lunch can be taken. And let's say uh, it, it takes the fielding side two minutes to complete the over. So at 12.02, at the end of the over, the bowlers in umpire will call over time and lunch. And lunchtime will be, we've covered it last week, 40 minutes. And it will be from 12.02 until 12.42. First ball needs to be bowled after lunch at 12.42. So we need to complete the over before, before taking uh, lunch. There is an exception. What is that e uh, exception? Let's have a look. And again, it's highlighted in a green. So there is an exam question based on point number two. So what is that exception? Law tell us, so when less than three minutes remains before the agreed time for the interval, and let's use lunchtime as um, an example. So if less than three minutes remains before lunch, you will take the interval immediately if a batter is dismissed or if a batter retires or players need to leave uh, the field. Let's say, example, it rains three, uh, less than three minutes to lunch. You need the players they need to leave the field. You will then take uh, um, lunch immediately. So this is the exception. So even though, let's use an example to illustrate point number two. At lunch is at 12 o'clock. At 11.58, uh, the third ball of the over, a batter gets dismissed. What, do you, what happens next? Lord tell us, because this is less than three minutes to go before the agreed time for our, our, our lunch interval, so the wicket fell at 11.58. Because the batter is now dismissed, it will be lunchtime. We will take lunch immediately. Lunch will then be from 11.58. When must the first ball be bowled after lunch? Yes, lunch will be 40 minutes later. So at 12.38, the first ball needs to be bowled after, after lunch. So this is the 
only time when a batter is dismissed or a batter retire or players need to leave the field and it happens in the middle of the over or the over was not completed and it's, it must be less than three minutes to go before lunch. If that is the case, you'll take an early lunch. If it happens, let's say a batter gets dismissed at 11.56. Can, do you take uh, lunch time? No, you don't take lunch time. Why don't you take lunch time? Because law tell us it needs to be less than three minutes. In our example, it is four minutes to go to lunch. So at 11.56, when the wicket fell, you won't take lunch. You will allow the next batter to come in and you will complete the over. Um, and if you do complete the over and you get to 12 o'clock, then you'll take lunch. Then... In our in our first example, where the wicket fell at 11:58, and it was let's say the fourth ball of the the over, and because it's less than three minutes, we will take an early lunch. Lunch will be from 11:58 till 12:58. Uh, at the resumption of play after lunch, because only four balls was bowled in the over, what happened with those two balls? You need to complete that two balls. So after lunch, the the, that particular over needs to be completed. That two balls needs to be bowled. So you'll bowl the two balls after lunch and and then at the end of the over, you'll, you'll call over. In modern cricket, and test match cricket is, is an example, there's a concept that's called the last hour of the match and a certain number of overs needs to be bowled during this last um, hour. I'm not going to, going to go into much detail in this level one course. For those of you that's going to do level two and level three with us, our level two course will start um, in, um, in June. We will go into much more detail, but for this level one course, and you will not be examined on this, but I'm just going, going to give you an idea what is uh, meant when the law tell us the last hour of the match? And then they also tell us a certain number of overs needs to be bowled in the last hour of the match. So in modern cricket, and I'll use test match cricket as an example, there's this concept of the last hour. So it, this last hour is the actual last hour of the match. Uh, when when I still played um, um, a club cricket for for many years, I actually thought this last hour uh, meant the last hour of the day. No, it's not that. It is the last hour of the match. So in our example of test of our test match, it spans over four, five days. So uh, day one will start at ten till uh, till five will be the end of play. Same hours for day two, day three, day four, and day five. So the last hour is on the last day of the match. On day five, the last hour will be from four o'clock up until five o'clock. And the law wants you to complete 20 overs, a minimum of 20 overs to be bowled in that last um, hour. Again, I'm just giving you an indication what the last hour means, what it is, the number of overs to be bowled in that last hour. For those of you that's going to do level two and three, we're going to go into much more detail with regarding to this um, part of the law that covers last hour of the match. Conclusion of the match. When is a match done? When is it um, concluded? And again, I'm going to use our test match as an example. Uh, we know test match spans over five days. It also spans over two innings. We're going to get to the uh, innings in the next uh, law. So when is the match concluded? When is the match at, at an end? When is the match done? So the match is concluded as soon as a result is reached. Soon as, and I'll, I'll use an example, you see now test match, India scores 200, South Africa uh, in their first innings, South Africa scores 115 in their first innings, India bat again, scores 100 in their, first, in their second innings, 
South Africa gets dismissed for 100 in their uh, second innings. So as soon as that final wicket falls in the South African innings, a result is then reached, and then that particular match is concluded. Match is also concluded as soon as both the minimum number of overs in the last hour are completed and the agreed time for close of play is also reached. In the previous slide, I've covered this concept of the last hour where on day five, it is from four o'clock until five o'clock and a minimum of 20 overs needs to be bowled according to the law in this last hour. So law tell us, point number two uh, tell us, so as soon as the 20 overs is bowled in that last hour, and also you've reached your agreed close of time, which is five o'clock, and there's no result has been reached, the match is concluded. Match is also concluded, and we're gonna cover point uh, three in the next law that speaks about um, uh, Innings and when is an innings um, uh, completed? But we'll get there when in in the next uh, law. So I'm not going to go into detail now. I'll get back to this point. And point number four is if players leave the field due to inclement uh, weather, whether it's ground weather, light or exceptional circumstances, and no further play is possible, and you haven't reached a result, innings has not been completed, minimum number of overs has not been reached, time has not be, been reached on the final uh, uh, day, and they need to leave the field due to weather and light, and there's no more time left, game is also concluded. Innings. The law tells us when it comes to innings, a match can either be one or two innings for each side, depending the agreement that are reached before uh, the match. In um, in our example of Test match cricket, we know the Test match cricket spans over two innings. There are many. Uh, competitions across the world where there's uh, where they do play uh, time cricket, but uh, it, it only only one innings per side. But that the, that's the um, agreement that the let's say the governing body that set up um, the rules and regulations and playing conditions for those competitions. It spans let's say over one innings, but in our example, Test match cricket spans over two innings for each side. The law also allow you to limit the innings to a number of overs or to a period uh, of of time. The law gives you the, a, a bit of leeway. In Test match cricket, there are no limitations. So the the first and the second innings uh, of both sides, there's no time limit. There's no overs overs limit. But there are many competitions across the world due to due to time constraints. Not all competitions like Test match cricket spans over five days. Some competitions spans over four days. Some over three. Um, some more day cricket uh, uh, spans over two uh, two days. Uh, just depending on on the um, playing conditions of that particular competition. But the law allows for for that leeway by 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 telling us. Yes, we can limit the innings to a number of overs or to even a period of time. So for for many years um, in the in the Western Cape, the Western Province Cricket Association that governs uh, cricket uh, in the Western Cape, Cape Town, South Africa, um, we played the uh, um, more day cricket, but it spanned over two days, over two weekends. Will it span over uh, two sat Saturdays? So what they decided was, or part of the playing condition was, that they will limit the first innings to a max of 60 overs. So that is what the, the playing condition was that was set in place. They'll limit the first innings. There was no limit on the second innings. So 60 overs, that was your max that a side could bat in their first innings. So once they've reached 60 overs, that innings is, is added in. What's the Once they've re um 
that's the let's say side A, 60 overs, that innings needs to come to an end. Side B, also bat for 60 overs. They cannot bat more than 60 overs. Uh, the um, innings would then be uh, at an end. You can you can also uh, put a, um, a period of time to it. Your first innings can only be, let's say, uh, three hours. Then your innings is at an end. The law allow for those type of uh, uh, agreement. But what the law also tell us um, that if in, in a one innings match, if it is an agreement that uh, that uh, shall apply, that agreement in a one innings match needs to apply to both innings. You cannot uh, give the um, side A 60 overs and side B only 50 overs, no. It needs to they uh, it needs to bet exactly the same sixty overs for both, or at amount of time three hours or four hours each for for both. In a two innings um, match, you can either put agreements in place um, either on the first innings, or only on the second innings, or even on both innings. Again, you can see the law allows for better leeway just depending on the. Um, the playing conditions that get set by the governing body for that particular uh, competition. In our test match, when the when more than one innings, or uh, if a game uh, spans over more than one innings, law tell us that they need to alternate. There are um, two exceptions, and we'll get there now. Uh, but if your game spans over two innings uh, um, for each side. They need to take the innings alternately. Captain cannot come to you and tell you, um, umpire, um, we're going to bat both our first and our second innings. Then we know we're done. And then we'll allow the, the other side to bat their first and second innings. No. Law, wants, uh, law tell us that side A needs to bat their first innings. And once either they dismissed or declare or, or whatever the case, and we'll get to the declaration and, and follow on later this e uh, evening. But the bottom line is what point number two is trying to tell us. Innings just needs to be taken alternatively. Alternately, so side A needs to bat their first innings. If they get dismissed, then side B bats their first innings. Once they get dismissed, then side A go bat their second innings and the inside B, the second innings. There are two exceptions. The follow-on is one, and the fourth itself in innings is one. In the next law, I will cover what the follow-on means, and in uh, law 15, Tom will cover what and fourth itself in innings means. So what is an com a completed innings so what is this innings so in our in, uh, in our example of test match uh, cricket so both sides get opportunity to have two innings so when is an innings completed so law tell us the innings are completed in the following circumstances if a side is all out the innings is completed if as if the uh, fielding side takes ten wickets, side is then all out. Innings is completed. At the fall of a wicket or the retirement of a batter, there are still balls to be bowled in that innings, but there are no more batters available to come in. In that instance, innings is also completed. I use an example to, to illustrate what this means. The um, side A uh, bats, uh, bats first in, in, in let's say, in, um, in our test match. The opening bat gets hit on the finger, needs to leave the field to get treatment, retires hurt. Um, they take a scan and they actually see that the finger is actually uh, broken. Not able to hold uh, a bat. The opening bat uh, um, comes to you and say, I'm, I'm not able to um, partake further in, uh, in, let's say, in this particular match or in this uh, test match. My finger is, is uh, broken. So in this case, 
side A went out to bat. This is now the opening bat that got injured. So side A scored 400 when the ninth wicket fell. But remember, the opening bat broke his finger. He's not able to partake further in the, in the test match. So now in this case, even though the side is only nine wickets down, but because the opening bat is not able to resume uh, his or her innings, that innings is then at an end. Even though they're nine, nine, only nine down, but the law now tells us the, um, the opening bat is not able to partake further, hence the innings is considered to be completed. If a captain declares the innings closed, that's another example when an innings is completed. So if a captain declares at 600 for the loss of three wickets, even though they've only lost three wickets, but because the captain declared that innings is completed. Uh, if a captain forfeits an innings, Tom will go into more detail what a, uh, what a forfeiture of an innings means. So if a captain forfeits um, his or her innings, the or his or her side's innings, that innings is also completed. Earlier we spoke uh, we spoke about if there has been an agreement to limit the let's say the first innings or even the second innings to a number of overs. Uh, we just, let's say we decided first innings maximum of sixty overs um, uh, per side. Once you've reached 60 overs, even though if you're only one down or no wickets down or five down, that innings after 60 overs is considered to be completed. The other side now needs to come uh, back in. Similarly, if there was a time uh, put on um, the innings, let's say the, the playing condition for that competition said three hours for your first innings, after three hours, that innings is done. If that is the case, after three hours, even though you may be only two or three weeks down because the playing conditions state that, you're, that you can only bet for three hours in your first innings, that innings will then also be at an end. The toss. <coughs> Excuse me. So when it comes to the toss, let's see <coughs> who needs to be at the toss. Well, let's see what the law say where the toss needs to take place. And let's see what the law say what time the toss needs to take place. Firstly, the law tell us that for the toss, both captains to be present when the toss is happening. Who else needs to be present when the toss is happening? According to the law, at least one umpire. Preferably both, but at least one umpire. So now we, we know who needs to be there. Both captains need to be there, preferably both umpires, but if there's a one umpire, so maybe umpire is late or stuck in traffic, or whatever the case, no issue, but at least one umpire needs to be present. So now we know who. Where does the toss take place? Law tell us that toss to take place on the field of play. So where is on the field of play? Basically, anyway, um, once you step, let, let's say there's a boundary um, um, a rope across the field. Once you step over the boundary rope inside the field of play, that is actually the, the field of play. The, you know, the, the whole field is seen as the field of play. The law tells us that the toss can happen anywhere on the field of play. As long as it's over the boundary rope inside the field of play, anywhere. Uh, but we know that tradition, where traditionally uh, does the um, uh, um, toss take place? Uh, right next to the uh, the match pitch. That is uh, tradition, where, where the toss usually takes place. But the law allows for the toss to take place anywhere on the field of play. So now we know who needs to be there. We know where it takes place. What are, what are the timings? The law tells us there's a window period that the toss can take place. What is that window period? Not earlier than 30 minutes, nor later than 15 minutes before the scheduled time for the match to start. I'll give an example to illustrate the window period. In our test match, the, um, 
play on day one starts at 10 o'clock. The window period that the toss needs to take place is any time between 9.30 and 9.45. So not earlier than 15, not earlier than 30 minutes, not later than 50, 15 minutes. So any time between 9.30 and 9.45, that toss can take place. Usually it takes place at uh, 9.30, half an hour before before play starts, but the, but the, the law... Uh, do give a window period of 15 minutes for the toss to take place. Again, this is highlighted in green. There is a question in the exam about the toss. Law also tell us that as soon as the toss is completed, the captain winning the toss needs to notify the opposing captain and the umpires of what his or her decision is, whether they're going to bat or field. They need to notify the opposing captain and umpires immediately. They cannot, captain cannot tell you, umpire, just give me two, three minutes. I'm going to have a chat with my coach or my team. I'll get back to you. No, they should have had that conversation before the captain came to the toss. As soon as the toss is completed, the, the captain winning it needs to tell uh, the opposing captain, whether he or she is going to bat or ball. And once notified, the decision then cannot uh, change. You cannot say, I'm going to bat. Uh, um, uh, you go off the field, the opposing team gets ready to bowl, and now you say 10 minutes before play starts, no, 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 I'm changing my mind, I want to I go bowl. No, once notified, the decision cannot be changed. The last law that I'm covering this evening is uh, the follow-on law and in the laws of cricket there's this concept of enforcing the follow-on I'll, um, I'll give examples that will that will illustrate this so what is this meaning you in uh, you uh, asking the team to follow on in in uh, previous slides we saw that the law tell us that teams need to take the innings um, alternately so side a go bat in their first innings once the innings is done then side b go bat then they get dismissed side a will then bat in their second innings and then side b will bat in their second innings that's us uh, usually how it happens but there are times where the law, and there, there's like two exceptions. The one exception is the follow-on, and the other exception is when the side forfeit the innings. Tom will handle that in the next law. But when it comes to um, that first exception, um, usually you need to alternate your innings. Side A, side B, side A, side B. But the one exception is in a two-innings match of five days or more, in our uh, our test match spans over five days. Many years ago, we found uh, test matches were, were played uh, over more than five days. But these days, the governing body, which is the International Cricket Council, um, the maximum uh, days that a test match gets played is five days. But many years ago, it was actually played over uh, more days. So in in five day uh, days um, if the match spans over five days which our test match uh, uh, does if a side bats first and that side lead by at least 200 runs that side will have the option of asking the other side to follow on in the innings i'll use a few example examples to illustrate what this follow on uh, concept of, uh, is. In our test match, let's use South Africa and New Zealand playing. South Africa bats first and scores 600 and they get dismissed for 600 in their first innings. New Zealand now go bat in their first innings. South Africa dismisses New Zealand for 350 runs in their first innings. So now what the law tell us is, 
if a side that was batting first and after both inning, first innings are completed, the side that bat first lead by at least 200 runs, that side will have the option of asking the other side to go follow on, asking the other side to go bat again. So in our example, so Africa scoring 600, dismissing New Zealand in their first innings for 350. So now you need to ask yourself the lead in the first innings. Is it at least 200 runs? In our example, the lead is 250 runs. And because the lead is 250 runs, the captain of South Africa has the option to exercise or have the option to ask New Zealand to go follow on, to bat again in their second, to bat again in their second innings. The option is available. The, the uh, captain of Africa does not have to exercise the option, but the option is there or is available to him or, or to her. But, but importantly, uh, side bats first, and they need to lead by at least 200 uh, runs. And if that is the case, they have this option of asking the, uh, the uh, opposing side to go back again. Just another example to illustrate this. Again, South Africa, New Zealand. This time I'll use New Zealand. New Zealand bats first. And it must be a side batting first that needs to lead by uh, at least 200 runs. So New Zealand batting first, scoring 500 in their first innings when they get dismissed. They dismissed South Africa for for 295. So the question you need to ask yourself, now the captain comes to you and asks you, um, can I uh, ask, New uh, ask South Africa to follow on? So New Zealand scored 500, South Africa 295. Captain of New Zealand asks, can I ask South Africa to follow on? So the question you need to ask yourself is, is the lead at least 200 runs? In our example, yes, the lead is 205. And because the lead is more than 200, yes, the option for New Zealand is available. You can tell the New Zealand captain, yes, you, you do have the option to exercise or to ask South Africa to follow on. Do you want to take that option? Yes or no? If yes, you will inform South Africa that New Zealand has exercised the option and they want you to follow on. Just a last example. South Africa now batting first, scoring 600. New Zealand scoring scoring 405 in the first innings. Again, captain asks you, can I enforce the follow on? What is the lead you need to ask yourself? The lead is 195. Because the lead is less than 200, you cannot enforce the follow on. You'll inform the captain your lead is only 195. You don't have the option to enforce the follow on. Not all games spans over five days. There are games that goes over three or four days. Like in South Africa, the um, the the provincial uh, cricket or Division One and the Division Two uh, provincial um, competition spans over four days. The um, there are uh, the Colts Division that spans over three days. So in games that spans over three or four days the lead needs to be at least 150 runs. The same principle will apply here. But in five, day, uh, five days or more, the lead needs to be at least 200 runs. If the game spans over three or four days, the lead needs to be at least 150 runs. If it's a two-day match, the lead needs to be at least 100 runs. And if it's a, a one-day match, the lead needs to be at least 75 runs. And this one-day match don't refer to, it's not referring to 
um, white ball cricket like a 50 over game or a, or a T20 game you some you find in many competitions uh, um, here in South Africa especially the the school competitions where they actually play more day cricket in one in one day they'll play they'll play two innings in one day um, and how do they how, how are they able to do it they do limit the um, the overs, um, they'll, they'll limit the first innings to a certain number of overs and they'll limit, limit the second innings to a certain number of overs to make sure that they can get four innings into one day. So if it's a one-day match and it's a more innings game, 75 runs is um, the follow-on or the lead needs to be at least 25 runs. I'm not going to give examples to this. The same principle apply as the examples I gave in a test match. Well, yes, test match is five days and the lead needs to be at least 200. Same principle applies for three or four days, but there the lead needs to be 150, two-day game, 100, and one-day match, 75. I'll cover point number two first before I get to point three. So if you or if the, the captain uh, and the lead is at least 200 runs and they do decide to exercise the option of asking the um, the opposing side to follow on. Uh, what needs to happen? They need to um, inform the umpires of this intention. Umpires will then um, inform the opposing captain. And once they notify that they want the other side to follow on, that decision cannot be changed. Point number three, there's this concept of first day's plays uh, lost. So if no play takes place on the first day of a match of more than one day's uh, duration, the follow-on target shall apply in accordance with the number of days remaining from the start of play. I'll use an example that would illustrate point number three um, uh, clearly. So in our five-day test match, we've, in the previous slide, we saw that for the uh, uh, captain batting first to enforce the follow-on, the lead needs to be at least 200 uh, runs. If the lead is less than 200, cannot enforce the follow-on. If it is at least 200, yes, they then can um, enforce the follow-on. But what point number three is saying is that let's say, for example, no play, take, no play takes place on the first day of our test match. So day one of the test match, not a single ball gets bowled. All day is rained out. And on day two, play starts at at 10 o'clock. So day two only play starts. So this is now because the whole first day was rained out. This is now a four-day test match. So it's day two, day three, day four, day five. Now to enforce the follow-on, the lead only needs to be 150 runs. I'll go to the previous slide. You'll see there in point number two, it says in a three or four-day game, to enforce the follow-on, the lead needs to be 150 runs. So this clause only takes effect if there's no play on the first day of a test match. Similarly, let's, let's use another example. Our test match, no play on day one, no, no play on day two, no play on day three. First ball gets bowled on the morning of day four. So that means our test match is only two days. So what will the follow, what uh, is what uh, does the lead needs to be to enforce the follow on for two days? It's a hundred runs. But the important thing I want you to take away from this: no play needs to take place on uh, the first day or the second or the third. If E, a, a last example, just to illustrate this, what they mean by no place to take, no play to take place on the first day. In, our, in uh, let's uh, use a test match as an example. Day one, play starts. So Africa is 300 for the last of four wickets at the end of day one. Now day two, it rains and not a single ball gets bowled on day two, and play only starts on day three again. 
So we lost the whole of day two. So technically, this is now going to be a four-day test match. But when it comes to the follow-on lead, this point number three, this clause only uh, gets triggered if no play on the first day. In our in this ex last example that I've used, we had play on the first day. We um, South Africa batted first and they scored 300. Yes, the whole of day two right now, but this clause can only get triggered if there's no play on the first day of our test match. But, um, so yes, we lost the whole of day two, but because we played on day one, this clause cannot get triggered. So yes, technically, we lost day two. The test match will only span over four days, but the lead in our the lead to enforce the follow-on will remain 200 runs because this clause was not triggered because we had play on day number one. That is all that I'm covering for this evening. Tom, thank you so much. I'm handing now over uh, to you. Thank you so much, Abdullah. Good evening to you and good evening to the attendees. I'll be taking you all through laws 15, 16 and 17, after which time I will open the floor to Q&A. Abdullah has alluded to law 15 already, declaration and forfeiture. Let's go through the definition of these two. And you'll notice that there is green text, which means there is a question in the Cricket South Africa Level 1 online exam related to a declaration. The law tells us that the captain of the side batting may declare an innings closed whenever the ball is dead during that innings. And so what does declaring an innings closed mean? It means that the captain feels his or her team have enough runs on the board and they will now stop batting. That is the end of that particular innings. So they have been batting and that's important to note. They've made as many runs as they feel they need whether it's in their first innings or their second innings, they may declare an innings closed whenever the ball is dead during that innings. And tomorrow we will cover when a ball becomes dead. What about forfeiture of an innings? Forfeiture of an innings can be done when either of his or her side's innings any time before the commencement of that innings. And as Abdullah mentioned, a forfeited innings shall be considered to be a completed innings. So what does that actually mean? It means that South Africa, let's say, for example, were batting first in the test match and then were bowled out for 350 runs. India, in their first innings decided they did not want to bat for whatever reason and they forfeited their innings and then South Africa would bat in their second innings straight afterwards. Very strange one. Has this ever happened in test match cricket? We shall soon see. Quite importantly, a captain shall notify the opposing captain and the umpires of his or her decision to declare or to forfeit an innings. And once notified, the decision cannot be changed. OK, so captains often consult their team before making such a decision. So let's have a look at the only example of a test match that had forfeited innings. It was in January 2000 between South Africa and England at Centurion in Pretoria. South Africa had already won the series 2-0 before the start of this fifth test. They batted first and were 155 for six 
after 45 overs on day one. The next three days were completely washed out. So no play on day two, no play on day three, and no play on day four. So come the morning of day five, which was the last day of the test match, then South African skipper Hansi Cronier offered his English counterpart, captain of England, Nassau Hussein, a one innings duel. Effectively, what this meant was that South Africa will bat on, and they ended up on 248 runs. Then England forfeited their first innings without facing a delivery. South Africa forfeited their second innings without facing a delivery. And England required 249 runs in 76 overs to win the match. Because that would have been the last innings of the match. And in their second innings, England did indeed reach that target with two wickets in hand and five balls to spare. It ended up a very exciting test match with a entertaining finish. But I'm sure most of you know that an investigation revealed that this match was fixed by Hansi Cronier. And so as a result of the match being fixed and discovered through the investigation that it was match fixed. The result of the match has been completely removed from the history books of test match cricket. But that remains the only time that there were forfeited innings in a test match. South Africa forfeiting their second innings, England forfeiting their first innings, and only batting once in the fourth innings of the match. Let's go on to Law 16, the result. Abdullah touched briefly on the results that can be attained or the fact that a match is concluded when the result is achieved. What are the different results that can be achieved in a cricket match? Let's see what the law says. A win in a two innings match can be achieved when the side which has scored a total of runs in excess of that scored in the two completed innings of the opposing side will win the match. Uh, what's important in this paragraph is that the losing team must have two completed innings. And later I will show you a video of a drawn test match where the fourth innings of the match was not completed. That's why it, there wasn't a win for either side. What about a win in a one innings match? This could be a T20 or a 50 over one day international. Law tells us that the side which has scored in its one innings, a total of runs in excess of that scored by the opposing side, again, in a completed innings, shall win the match. That's pretty straightforward. I think most of us watch more one innings matches than we do two innings matches. And there the result is uh, very straightforward. And there are no draws in one innings matches. There are ties. We will look at the difference between a draw and a tie shortly. What about umpires awarding a match? Can 
an umpire or umpires award a match and why would they do so? Law tells us that a match shall be lost by a side which either concedes defeat or in the opinion of the umpire refuses to play. Now, why would a side concede defeat or refuse to play? We will have a video that shows an example of umpires awarding a test match. If the umpires regard that a team has conceded defeat or has refused to play, then they shall award the match to not side. An action by any player or players might constitute a refusal by either side to play, then the umpires together shall ascertain the cause of the action. If they then decide together that this action does indeed constitute a refusal to play by one side, they shall so inform the captain of that side. If the captain persists in the action, the umpire shall award the match in accordance with 16.3.1 in the previous slide. Let us watch a video which explains a very controversial test match where England was awarded a match by the umpires due to the umpires suggesting or believing that Pakistan refused to play. Uh, Abdullah, please let me know if there is no sound on the video, uh, but I do believe there should be. Over the last 140 years, more than 2,300 test matches have been played. Over 1,500 of these have ended in a result. Over 700 have been drawn and two have been tied. And only one has ended in a forfeit. The thing I remember about the forfeit test is none of us had a clue what was going on, really. According to law 16.3.2, a match shall be lost by a side which, in the opinion of the umpires, refuses to play. On August 20, 2006, this rule was invoked for the first time on an afternoon that swung wildly between high drama and farce. An hour before tea on the fourth day, at the end of the 56th over of England's second innings, Umpires Daryl Hare and Billy Doctrove asked for a change of ball. Uh, it's one of the umpires came out with a, a new box of balls. It's clear they were changing the ball. No big deal there. But instead of asking the bowling side to choose the new one, he asked the batting side, you think, oh, hello, interesting. The umpires then awarded England five penalty runs, confirming that they had pulled Pakistan up for tampering with the ball. The trouble was there was no evidence, no jelly, no dirt, no sandpaper. Uh, a lot of people have looked at that ball, have different opinions. Some feel it was clearly tampered with and some think it was more than just playable. It was a good looking ball. Um, others think you can see some evidence of scratching, but none that suggests it's been done on purpose and by hand um, or even by a foreign object. So very mixed views. It was after the tea break, taken more than 15 overs, after the five-run penalty, the things really escalated. The umpires walked out, the English batsmen walked out, the Pakistanis didn't. They, they felt hugely wronged. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they weren't sure that whether they wanted to come out. After waiting for 20 minutes, the umpires walked to the Pakistan dressing room, came back a few minutes later and took the bails off. And uh, the matches have been supported or abandoned or no, wrong, none of that. We hear the match has been awarded to England. Oh. That wasn't the end of it either. After a protest lasting almost an hour and following discussions with match referee Mike Proctor, Inzamam al-Haq finally 
leads the Pakistan team out again. This time, though, the umpires stay put. They've made their decision and they're sticking by it. My view of that is, was that it was very inflexible. Mike Crotter was the match referee in a very difficult position. I think there should have been an instruction from on high from the chief executive or chairman of ICC that this is a unique situation because of the unproven circumstances. In a proven circumstance of a tampered ball and the side refusing to come out, fair enough. But this was unproven. Several hours after the bails were taken off, the ICC and the English and Pakistan cricket boards confirm in a joint statement that the match had indeed been forfeited. The hits kept on coming. With no evidence to back up the accusation, the ICC dropped the ball tampering charges. But Inzamam was banned for four one days for refusing to lead his team out. They also removed hair from international duty, who in turn threatened to sue the ICC and the PCB for racial discrimination. Two years later, the ICC overturned the result from a Pakistan loss to a draw, but the MCC refused to recognize this. It was all incredibly nasty and another stain on the game. And there's never been any concrete proof that Pakistan were in the wrong anyway. To date, this remains the only scorecard in history to state England awarded the match, opposition refused to play. In the end, though, there was only one real loser, cricket itself. Very controversial test match that ended as a loss for cricket. I think it's important as umpires for us not to jump to conclusions when it comes to something as controversial as ball tampering. In uh, level three, we deal with changing the condition of the ball and how we as umpires need to deal with it. Uh, so please join us in August for that. Uh, of course, you need to pass level one and level two in June before you can join us for level three. Uh, but put simply, we need to have concrete evidence to be able to ping a team for ball tampering or changing the condition of the ball. And there are certain procedures that we need to follow. And if the procedures were followed uh, slightly uh, better, I think, by those two umpires, uh, then it would have alleviated the controversy that followed. Um, so please uh, let us not award matches left, right and centre for teams refusing to play. Let us hear each team out uh, before making a decision on such controversial matters. So let's look into ties and draws and the definition and the difference of the two. When is a match tied? The result of a match shall be a tie when all innings have been completed and the scores are equal. So what's important in this statement is that all innings have been completed. And Abdullah took us through how innings are completed. A draw, by definition, is when a none of the other results have been achieved. OK, so it's not a win to either side. The match hasn't been awarded to either side. It was not a tie then the match will be a draw. In limited overs cricket, um, if a match is washed out in a 50 over match before both sides have had the opportunity to bat for 20 overs, then a no result would be the result. A, a draw happens in more day cricket, and we shall soon watch an example of a very exciting test match between England and Zimbabwe that ended in a draw, even though the scores were level. 
So sit back, relax. We're going to watch Heat Streak, uh, the late great Heat Streak, bowling the last over of the match to uh, England. And England needed a certain amount of runs to win the match, uh, but they were in no trouble or in no danger of being bowled out. So Zimbabwe could not win the match. Uh, they also could not tie the match. Uh, it was up to England to try and win the match in the last over. Uh, let us watch the over and then after the five minutes, I will discuss why it was a draw and not a tie. A streak will be the bowler. England will be smiling at the end of this over. They need 13 runs to win this match. Zimbabwe in no hurry. Campbell's going to make sure that every corner of this boundary is patrolled. Streak tonight. On boundary, anything can happen. Down the leg side. Perfectly legitimate today. One ball gone with no runs scored. One day cricket would be illegal and test cricket. It's quite legitimate. So they bowled very well in the streak. And particularly Guy Whittle, who came on. The game was probably still in England's favour. It was to attract it back. Oh, very well. Knight's got it out to long off. Darren Goff prepared to sacrifice his wicket, but he's got back for two. Flower, the fielder, making sure there'd be no overthrow. Allowed England back for two. I think Zimbabwe will settle for that. That's what Knight's looking for. He's chipped it over. It's hit for six. Unbelievable. Nick Knight's got his team away over mid-wicket for six runs. Now England are back in it. England now need five runs to win off three balls. The England supporters are going crazy. Five off three balls. Does he leave everyone on the boundary or does he bring someone in? Nick Knight, the hero of the hour now. That six runs has made all the difference. Have a look at this. You can keep firing it in the same area. That's from Will eventually be able to adjust. And that's what's happened here. Nick Knight, 92, not out now. One, six, five, fours. That has changed everything. Five runs now, needed, and three runs. A lot of critics of one day cricket, but uh, that shot would never have been played in a test match 15 years ago. Here's streak tonight. England require five. That's why outside the off stump. No signal from umpire in Robinson. England now requiring five on two. How does he streak field? Full toss, Knight can only get it away for one. Goff will definitely come back for the second run. He's made it with a dive. Streak can't take the ball cleanly. England scramble two, three to win off the last ball. We've seen one day finishes all over the world. We've never seen a test match finish like this. Now, the batsmen are in conference. The big three for Zimbabwe in conference. Campbell has told the bowler what to do. He goes out onto the boundary edge. Andy Flower wishes he Street good luck. Nick Knight takes a few deep breaths. England need three runs to win off the very last ball to win this test match. Can Nick Knight conjure up another boundary? One feel it has to be a boundary now for England to win this match. Here comes Street. Knight's down the trap. He's got it out to deep cover. There's a man there. This two will bring the scores level. Andy Flowers got it. Darren Goff mainly goes for the third round. The scores are level. But the match is drawn. England finished tantalizingly. 
One run short. They couldn't get the final run. Nick Knight finishes on 96 not out. What a test match day we've seen here in Bulawayo. England finish just one run short. Controversial tactics from Zimbabwe as they fire the ball wide either side of the wicket. I'm sure England would have done the same thing in their situation. This is test match cricket, remember. Zimbabwe have fought all the way and out of the fire have salvaged the draw. That was an absolutely amazing game of cricket. One of the most exciting you could ever wish to see and one of the most historical because for the first time in the history of Test Match Cricket, a match has been drawn with the scores level. So the match was drawn with the scores level. Let's just have a look at the scores there. Zimbabwe 376 in their first innings. England 406 in their first innings. Zimbabwe 234 in their second innings. And all of those innings were completed. As you can see, um, the sides were all out. And then in the last innings of the match, England finished up at 204 for six. The scores were level. They needed 205 to win the match. So because that last innings of England was not completed, remember a completed innings uh, needs to be all batters out. Because that innings was not completed, that means the test match was drawn and not tied. If England were bowled out 204 runs for 10 wickets, then the test match would have been tied because that last innings would have been completed. But because the innings was not completed, uh, we ran out of time and overs in the match, uh, but that did not complete the innings that completed the match. That is why the result is a draw with the scores level. Let's look at what the law says about the winning runs when they are hit. If a boundary is scored before the batters have completed sufficient runs to win the match, the whole of the boundary allowance shall be credited to the side's total. And in the case of a hit by the bat to the striker's score. Let me give you an example to illustrate this point. Say, for example, South Africa is uh, batting against uh, England. And Quinton de Kock is on 98 not out. And South Africa need uh, one run to win. If Quinton de Kock hits the ball towards the boundary and they make good their ground on the opposite ends, then the match will be completed and that will leave Quinton de Kock stranded on 99 not out with the match ending in a win for South Africa. If he is clever, he will not complete the run. He will wait for the ball to cross the boundary and then four runs will be scored he will get to 102 not out and South Africa will still win the match. So it's very important as a bowler's end umpire to check whether the run was completed by the, the two batters making good their ground on the opposite ends before the ball crossed the boundary. If they only needed one run to win the game, then the match ends on the completion of that one run. But if the boundary, the ball crosses the boundary before the batters make good their ground on the opposite ends, 
then the total of the boundary is added to the strikers score as well as the team score. So what do we say to mention the result of a match? If the side batting last wins the match without losing all of its wickets, the result shall be stated as a win by the number of wickets still to fall. So England in that previous video against Zimbabwe ended up on 204 for six wickets. If they had got to their target of 205 with six wickets down, we all know that a team to be all out has to lose 10 wickets. So Lord tells us that 10 minus six is four. So if England had reached 205 for six in that test match against Zimbabwe, they would have won by four runs. Sorry, by four wickets. That's the number of wickets still in hand when they reach the target score. If the fielding side, if the side fielding last wins the match, the result shall be stated as a win by runs. So simple example. In a T20 match, Rajasthan Royals scored 220 runs and Mumbai Indians scored 200 runs all out or their 20 overs are complete. Then Rajasthan Royals have won by 20 runs, 220 minus 200. If the match is decided by one side conceding defeat or refusing to play, the result shall be stated as match conceded or match awarded, whichever the case might be. What if there is a mistake in scoring? Law tells us that if after the players and umpires have left the field in belief that the match has been concluded, the umpires then discover that a mistake in scoring has occurred, which affects the result, then they shall adopt the following procedure. If when the players leave the field, the side batting last has not completed its innings and either the number of overs to be bowled in the last hour or in that innings has not been completed, or the agreed time for close of play or for the end of the innings has not been reached. And unless one side concedes defeat, the umpires shall order play to resume. So that means we go back and we complete the game according to the correct score. Law goes on further to tell us that unless a result is reached sooner, play will then continue if, of course, ground weather and light permissions conditions permit. And until the prescribed number of overs has been completed and either time for close of play has been reached or the allotted time for the innings has expired. No account shall be taken of the time between going off and the resumption of play. So if you are playing time cricket, that five or 10 minutes that we spent off the field, checking the score and realizing that it was incorrect, it will not be taken into account in terms of how much time is left in the match. Once the umpires have agreed with the scorers, the correctness of the scores at the conclusion of the match, the result cannot thereafter be changed. In Western Province Cricket Association club cricket here in Cape Town, there are match cards that both captains need to sign. And once those match cards have been signed with the scores and the result confirmed, 
then the result cannot thereafter be changed by either side or the governing body. Last law that we shall be covering this evening is law 17, the over. How many balls constitute an over in cricket? I'm sure you all know. The ball shall be bowled from each end alternately in overs of six legal deliveries. When does an over start? This is in green, so it is examined in the Cricket South Africa Level 1 online exam that you shall be attempting from the 13th to the 23rd of May. An over has started when the bowler starts his or her run-up. If he or she does not have a run-up, then when his or her bowling action for that first delivery starts. What is the bowling action? It is starts when the back foot of the bowler lands. I mentioned that an over constitutes six legal deliveries. What makes a delivery legal? Let's have a look at when a delivery shall not count as one legal ball in the over. If the ball is called dead or it is considered to be dead before the striker has had an opportunity to play it, then it shall not count as a legal delivery in the over. If a ball is called dead in the circumstances of law 20.4.2.5 when the striker is not ready for the delivery and pulls away, or 20.4.2.6 when the striker is distracted while receiving a delivery, then it shall not count as a legal delivery in the over. If a delivery is a no ball or a wide, it shall need to be re bowled and does not count as a legal delivery in the over. There are a couple of other circumstances when a ball will not be a legal delivery in the over. When a player returns to the field without permission of an umpire and comes into contact with the ball, the ball immediately becomes dead. Five penalty runs will be awarded to the batting side and that ball will not count as a legal delivery in the over, it shall need to be re -bowled. When there is illegal fielding, for example, a player takes off his or her cap and fields the ball using that extended cap, that is an example of illegal fielding. That ball will not count as a legal delivery in the over and will need to be re -bowled. If there is a deliberate attempt to distract the striker or there's a deliberate distraction, deception or obstruction of either batter in a delivery, then that delivery shall not count as a valid delivery in the over and will need to be re -bowled. And of course, a ball shall not count as one of the six legal deliveries of the over unless it is delivered. Uh, quite often you see uh, bowlers maybe miss timing their run ups and then aborting just before they get to the crease. That obviously is not considered a valid delivery in the over because the ball was not delivered. Any delivery other than those listed on the previous slide shall be known as valid balls and only valid balls shall count towards the six balls in the over. When do we call over as an umpire? 
when six valid balls have been bowled and when the ball becomes dead after the sixth valid ball in the over, the umpire shall call over before leaving his or her position behind the bowler's end stumps. Quite important that you wait until the ball becomes dead and we will cover dead ball tomorrow. Wait until the ball becomes dead before you call over. What happens if we as umpires miscount? Before we go into this, I want to give you a few tips as to how we as a team make sure that we do not miscount the six legal deliveries in an over. We have signals as on-field umpires for three balls left in the over. So every over for you to communicate with your partner to ensure that you do not miscount an over, we will signal three balls left by halfway. That is the universal signal for three balls left in the over. Two balls left in the over. Simple show of two. And what's important with your signal for two is that it is the same every time. So don't signal two over here for one over and then two over here for the next over and two down there for your next over. Keep it consistent throughout so that your partner knows where to look for your two signal. OK, and then uh, the one signal. I make the one signal across my chest. And again, make sure that your one signal is the same every time you signal it. Uh, quite a lot of umpires like to stick their finger out to the side uh, of their body as their signal for one. Uh, choose a signal and stick to it and be consistent with it and make sure that you communicate your signals to your partner before the match, especially if you're umpiring with a new partner for the first time. If there is a no ball or a wide ball or a dead ball in the over, then it's a good idea to confirm how many balls are left in the over after that no ball, wide or dead ball has been bowled or not bowled in the case of some dead balls. Um, so if the first delivery of an over is a no ball, then there are still six legal deliveries remaining in the over. So how do we show six deliveries remaining? We simply put out a fist, and that is the universal signal for six balls remaining in the over. Uh, five is usually just uh, five out there, easily visible. Uh, then the four needs to be distinct from the five. So I put my four to my chest. And then three, two and one I have showed you. If you repeat your signals and confirm them with your partner after every no ball, after every dead ball, after every wide ball, you should not miscount. Also, if there is a wicket during the over, then you come together as two umpires and you confirm how many balls are left after that wicket in the over. Please it might seem like a very simple task to count to six, but uh, in 35 degrees Celsius heat, when there are a lot of no balls, dead balls, and wides in an over, maybe a wicket or two, and also 
if there's a stoppage for an injury, for example, those are often the times that we lose count. So that's when you need to be most uh, careful. You can also, if you and your partner disagree as to how many balls are left in the over, you can um, stop the game for a couple of seconds. We at provincial and international level have the luxury of um, walkie talkies or radios that we can get on and call our third umpire to ask or if we don't have a third umpire, we can communicate with the scorers via radio to ask the scorers how many balls are left in the over. If you don't have that luxury, then you can stop the game and it will look a little bit village to shout across the field to ask the scorers, scorers, how many balls left, please? But that is far better than actually getting a five ball over or a seven ball over confirmed as an over. So that leads us to this point. What happens if umpires miscount an over? If the umpire miscounts the number of valid balls, the over as counted by the umpire shall stand. So if we after five balls, incorrectly call over and we both as the on-field umpires agree that we got to six but we actually hadn't and we call over then that over is over and we will move to our positions for the start of the next over if before you start the next over you realize that you have miscounted and you both agree that you have miscounted, then you can go back to your position to complete the sixth ball in the over. Uh, what happens if you have bowled seven balls in the over and only then you call over? That seventh ball does count and will be recorded by the scorers. Uh, they probably will notify you at your next interval as to your miscounting but the ball as bold will count because the umpires allowed a seventh ball in the over to be bold. If having miscounted, the umpire allows an over to continue after six valid balls have been bold, he or she may subsequently call over as the ball becomes dead after any delivery, even if that delivery is not a valid ball. I'll give you an example to illustrate this point. So we bowled six legal deliveries. We should have called over, but for whatever reason, the two of us umpires on field have miscounted. So we think we should bowl another ball the seventh ball of the over is bowled and it is a no ball and only after that no ball is bowled do we realize that oh dear we've miscounted that was actually the seventh delivery in the over because we have realized that six legal deliveries have already been bowled in the over even though that is a no ball that usually should be re -bowled. law tells us in this point that we can then call over because we've now realized that six legal deliveries were bold and we should have called over. That no ball will still stand and whatever runs were scored off that no ball will still count However, we are allowed by this law to then call over because six legal deliveries have been bold. Please, to avoid all of this confusion, go back to the tips I've given you to make sure that you do not miscount an over. Very embarrassing and could be costly to either side in a 
match, especially in T20 or T10 cricket. Can a bowler change ends? Let's see what the law says. The law tells us that a bowler shall be allowed to change ends as often as desired, provided he or she does not bowl two overs consecutively, nor bowl parts of each of two consecutive overs in the same innings. So here at Newlands Cricket Ground, we have two ends. We've got the Weinberg end, which is the start side of the field. And we've got the uh, Calvin Grove end, which is the north end of the field. So if Nandre Berger opens the bowling from the Weinberg end and completes the first over, he can then not bowl the second over of the match from the Calvin Grove end. Why? Because this law tells us that no bowler can bowl two consecutive overs, no bowl any part of two consecutive overs in the same innings. So Buren Hendricks would have to bowl or any other bowler would have to bowl the second over of the innings. And then Andre Berger can bowl the third over of the innings, which would be uh, the second over from the Weinberg end. What happens if Western Province, the home side here at Newlands Cricket Ground in Cape Town, they are playing a four day match against uh, the Lions from Johannesburg. If Western Province score 500 runs in their first innings and the Lions score 300 runs in their first innings. The lead is 200. If we go back to Abdullah's slides of the required leads in a four day match to enforce a follow on, the requirement is a lead of 150 runs or more. So that lead of 200 runs is enough for Western Province to enforce the follow on. So let's say, for example, Nandre Berger bowled the last over for Western Province of the first batting innings of the Lions and he took the 10th wicket. Can Nandre Berger bowl the first over of the Lions follow on innings, which happens to be the next over in the match. So yes, there will be a change of innings. There will be a 10 minute interval for that. Uh, but Nandre Berger bowled, let's call it the 87th over of the Lions first innings, which happened to be the last over in that innings. Can Nandre Berger bowl the first over of the Lions follow on innings 10 minutes later? I want you to put your answer in the chat box. So I will just uh, repeat that scenario. The scenario is Western Province batted first. They scored 500 runs. The Lions batted second. They scored 300 runs and Nandre Berger, who is a Western Province bowler, he bowled the last over of the Lions' first innings. Because the lead was 200 runs, the captain of Western Province, Carl Verena, requested the Lions to follow on. So instead of the Western Province team batting next, the Lions followed on and are batting in the third innings. Nandre Berger bowled the last over in the second innings of the match. Can Nandre Berger bowl the first over in the third innings of the match? That is the answer I would like you all to punch into the chat box, yes or no. How does 
an over end. Law tells us that other than at the end of an innings, a bowler shall finish an over in progress unless he or she is incapacitated or suspended under the laws of cricket. If for any reason other than the end of an innings, an over is left uncompleted at the start of an interval or interruption, it shall be completed on resumption of play. Abdullah mentioned that if a batter is out two minutes before the lunch break, then we will take lunch immediately. Even if it's halfway through the over, that over will be completed after the lunch interval. So what happens if a bowler is incapacitated or suspended during an over? This is the process that we need to follow. Law tells us that if for any reason a bowler is incapacitated while running up to deliver the first ball of an over or is incapacitated during an over, the umpire shall call and signal dead ball. And another bowler shall complete the over from the same end provided that the replacement bowler does not bowl two overs consecutively, nor bowl any part of two consecutive overs in that innings. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. If a bowler gets injured during an over, another bowler will have to complete that over, but that bowler that replaces the injured bowler cannot have bowled the previous over and will not be allowed to bowl the next over if we are still in the same innings. That is all of the material we have to present this evening. I am now going to allow all of you to activate your microphones and also your cameras. We shall go into the chat box first and deal with the questions that have arisen while we've presented. And then we shall uh, deal with the hands that are up in the meeting room. So, Liesl Maritz is struggling with recovery after surgery and she will work through the recordings. All the best with your recovery from surgery, Liesl. I hope it went well and that you will recover sooner rather than later. Uh, yes, all lectures are recorded and hopefully posted onto our YouTube channel. Um, a few hours after the end of each lecture. So Deepak asks, uh, why did the offer in the test match between South Africa and England change from 270 runs in 73 overs to 249 in 76 overs? Uh, Deepak, I think that offer that initially was spoken about of 270 and 73 overs was in the morning before the start of the day's play. And as uh, the match unfolded on the fifth day, uh, South Africa decided to declare when they had a lead of 248 for England to score 249 runs to win in 76 overs so uh it just i think was a, a change in tactics uh from the south africans uh and that's what louis is trying to explain there deepak asks is there any penalty for illegal fielding or distraction by the bowling side abdullah you want to take that one? 
we will go into more detail in uh, level two and level three, but we can uh, briefly um, entertain Deepak's question here. Uh, yes, Deepak, uh, when it comes to e illegal fielding uh, by the, the fielding side, and we will, we will cover that in law 28 in more detail. So the punishment for uh, illegal fielding is uh, five penalty runs, all not to count as one for the over. Um, we, the batting side, get the runs, uh, including the run in progress, um, as soon as the ball became dead or as soon as the illegal penalty, uh, the illegal fielding happens. So yeah, there's quite a stiff penalty for illegal fielding. I bet we'll go into it in more detail when we get to law 27. With regards to distraction by the bowling side, um, yes, they also, we will cover this in detail when we, uh, if you're going to join us um, for level two and level three, there we cover law 41 in detail. And yes, there are um, punishments for uh, distraction by the, by the fielding side if it happens before the ball gets bowled. Um, we immediately go into action. So if the distraction happens before the, by any members of, of the fielding side, before the ball gets bowled, we get five penalty runs. If the distraction, uh, obstruction uh, happens after the ball gets bowled, also five penalty runs. Um, ball not to count as one for the over. Uh, the uh, batters get the runs. Um, we we'll report the incident, so they are they are quite hefty punishment for distractions by the by the fielding side. Over, Tom. Thanks, Tula. Just a reminder that um, Cricket South Africa's Level One exam covers uh, laws one through to law forty. Uh, law forty one which is unfair play and law 42, which is player conduct, are not covered in the exam. So we do not go through those two laws. However, the presentation that I have sent out to all of you on the course material does include slides on law 41 and 42. So you can go through that in your own time for your own knowledge. Deepak also asks Abdullah, if any part of the bowler's body hits the wicket with or without taking the bails off, is that a no ball? We will go into no ball tomorrow, uh, but uh, let's uh, talk about it. I think the, the, the question, the key part of this question, Dula, is with or without taking the bails off. So could you please answer both scenarios? So Deepak? Yes, any part of the bowler's uh, body uh, put the wickets down, i.e. take off the bails while the ball is in play and the bowler is del uh, busy delivering the ball. Yes, umpire to call and signal no ball. Without taking off the bails, no, you do not call no ball. The law tell us the uh, wicket needs to be down, i.e. the bails needs to be off for you to call no ball. So if the umpire, if the bowler, um, let's say, just brushes uh, the um, the wicket with any part of the body, but the bowlers do not get this lot, you will not call and signal no ball. So for no ball to be called, the wicket needs to be down, bowlers needs to be off, and it needs to be with any part of the, uh, the bowler's body, or tomorrow you'll see any part of... Uh, um, clothing that may also drop from the bowler's uh, um, body. Some bowlers bowl with a bowling towel or a towel to dry their hands. If that also falls from the bowler's body onto the wicket and dislodges the bales, um, umpire also to call and signal no ball. And then just lastly, it needs to be either part of the bowler's body or the um, uh, any clothing that may fall onto the wicket. If the wind blows off the bells while the bowler is uh, running in and now the wicket is down, that will not be a no ball. Or if wind takes it off, not a no ball. It needs to be part of the bowler's body or any clothing that may fall off the bowler's um, person onto the wickets. 
Over, Tom. Thanks, Tula. Uh, if I can just add to that, and we will go into more detail tomorrow, but uh, the ball needs to be delivered for you as a bowler's end umpire to call no ball. If the bowler does not deliver the ball, then you call and signal dead ball rather than no ball. Another question from uh, Deepak. Uh, I'll take this one, Abdullah. Um, he says, if a wicket falls on the seventh ball of an over, will that count as well? Even if the batter hasn't uh, gone off the field, walking towards the dressing room. Uh, yes, Deepak, it is very unfortunate that a seventh delivery was allowed to be bowled by the umpires. But if a seventh delivery is bowled and a batter is dismissed, that batter will be out. If a seventh delivery is bold and it is hit for six, that runs will count as six. So the ball will count as bold. Okay, there is no cancellation of a ball just because it was the seventh ball of an over. Um, that is quite clear in law. Then all of you seem to have answered my quiz question correctly. Bakang gave us the reason. Yes, Nandre Berger can bowl the first over of the Lions follow on innings because it's the start of a new innings. Law is quite clear that no bowler can bowl consecutive overs in the same innings but you can bowl consecutive overs in the same match if they are in different innings. Okay. Well done. Absolutely everybody has answered that correctly. Francis John asks, if the fielding team has 12 players on the field at once, is that illegal fielding? Abdullah. Francis, to answer your question first, no, it's not illegal fielding. To expand on this, one of uh, the important duties of an umpire is to make sure that there's only 11 fielders at any given time onto the field of play. So part of our, uh, um, if I can uh, practically show you, what we do is before the game starts, before the uh, Paulus and Ampau call play, one of your duties is to count the amount of fielders um, uh, on the field, make sure that there is 11, and um, only after confirming that, then you can call a play. Similarly, after, um, after a um, interval or rain interruption, always make sure that the, you have 11 players on the field at any uh, given given time. That's not the only time. I mean, you can make uh, regular checks, but but those are the important times just to double check that you do have eleven fielders at on the field at um, at any given time. Um, yeah. So if you now do allow for twelve players on on the field, that is an oversight, a mistake made by the umpires. Uh, that does not cover illegal fielding. You made a mistake. If you do a pickup, if that player or any player do touch the ball, it's not illegal fielding. Uh, when you do realize your mistake, you need to ask the fielding captain to send one of the players off the field. Over, Tom. Thanks, Tula. Ali Zohaib has mentioned in the chat box that he's got a question to ask. We are going to now go to the hands in the uh, meeting room. Yes, sir. Um, Can I ask? I'm audible, sir. Ali, you are audible. Uh, please go ahead. The floor is My yours. My question is to Sir Abdullah that what would an umpire is supposed to examine if a fielding side captain requests for a change of ball? That's for more than one one day cricket. And if also he asks for a change of ball in limited overs cricket. What would an umpire is supposed to examine? 
so, um, so, so Ali, the, so are you saying the fielding captain comes up to you and asks you to change the ball? The, yes, the, needs the to fielding be, the captain need, comes, yeah. comes up and requests to, uh, to me as to ask for the change of the ball. So what should I am supposed to examine? There needs to be a good reason why you need to change the ball. Usually, uh, in, in, in your instance, uh, if the ball needs to be changed, it either needs to be out of shape, and there is a method um, that we do practice at international and at the provincial level. We do have um, a bowling gauge. The umpire's, uh, umpire will just take out the user of bowling gauge and put it through the rings. If it goes through the rings, the ball is then still in shape and you will just toss it back to the captain and ask the captain you know, to continue playing. Or tell the captain to continue playing. If it doesn't go through the bowling rings, there um, Tom just put a picture of the the bowling gate on the um, on the screen. So if it goes through the rings, the ball is still uh, in shape. Play can continue. If it does not go through the bowling rings, that means the ball is out of shape. And then there is a reason, because the ball is out of shape, um, you can now choose the replacement ball. You'll ask the reserve umpire to come onto the field. You'll then choose the replacement ball, and um, you will then choose a ball that has similar wear and tear to the, the match ball. So you'll look at the match ball, you look at uh, the replacement balls, and you, you need to find um, a ball that has similar way. You'll, you'll hardly find a ball that is exactly the same condition, but you need to find one that is as close as possible to the, um, the condition of, of the ball that needs to, needs to be changed. So that is if a ball is out of shape. Other reasons why a ball might be changed is, let's say, the, the, the seam is perhaps coming loose. You need to look at it. If, uh, if you um, uh, see that the seam is uh, coming loose, you can then also uh, uh, change the, the ball. Um, but there need to be, if a fielding captain comes to you, there needs to be a, a reason why the ball needs to be changed. A fielding captain just cannot come to you and ask, umpire would like the ball changed. So it, it, it either lost, as uh, point number four is saying on the screen, or it, uh, it's become unfit for play. And usually unfit for play is out of shape, you know, uh, seam becoming loose. A uh, ball is um, very, very wet. Seam is so, uh, so wet that there's a need to be uh, for the ball to be replaced. Those are usually the reasons why a ball needs to be replaced. Did Thank I answer you your it, question, can Ali? I, can I add something more? The same procedure will happen for a one-day game also if the ball is get discolored, sir? Or does yes, discolored will also fall into that category. Uh, you need to, uh, in your opinion, and, and you can work together as a team, uh, mm -hmm. Both umpires can look at it, and if both umpires feel that the ball has become the discolored and there's a need to be changed, yes, you can change the ball. Yeah, sometimes, sir. Actually, the problem is that sometimes the match situation, the captains uh, are you know far behind the game. They try to play some tricks with the umpires. Yeah. So in this situation, how should we handle it? Yeah, that's exactly. So you need to be aware of the match uh, situation. You need to be aware that yes, players will try to put pressure on on uh, on umpires. They uh, um, they will. Let's say they it's a flat pitch. The ball is uh, not doing anything. They will then put pressure on you to change the ball. They'll come. They'll always come to you. Umpire, the ball is out of shape. They'll try to put pressure on you to get the ball changed. Sometimes the ball is a little bit wet. Um, they want a dry ball. They'll put pressure on you. You need to be uh, strong as a, as as a team. Um, you need to look at each situation, um, um, you know, separately. Um, if there is a reason for the ball to be changed, um, you then change it. Uh, but if there's no reason and you need to be aware of the match situation, you need to be aware that captains, uh, fielding captains will try to put uh, pressure on you to have that uh, ball change. You need to be strong in those situations. Uh, you need to be aware what, they, what they're trying to do. And if there's no reason, the ball is not unfit for play, you need to be strong. You need to tell the captains, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this ball. Thank you, captain. Please continue with play. They will try to put pressure on you. They will moan and groan, but you need to stand your ground. You need to be 
need to be strong. Um, they, they many times they'll come back to you. They will come back uh, many a times again. Yeah, you need to be strong. If this ball is not unfit, you keep on telling them it's no problem with the ball. Continue play. Thank you, sir. Okay, over Tom. Much appreciated, sir. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Abdullah. Next hand up is Mohammed Manga. Mohammed, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Yeah, um, greetings to you all uh, from the Gambia again. Um, Tom, I have uh, my my question is um, about law sixteen hmm. on the win winning hit or extras. Yes. Um. I heard you saying something about uh, Quentin Decock, then my connection um, scrambled. So can you please go back uh, there and then help me out to understand better, if possible? Sure, no problem, Mohammed. So I made the, I sketched the scenario where uh, Quentin Decock is on 98 runs and uh, South Africa need one run to win the match. So nine. Quinton de Kock would like to score his uh, 100 and also win the match for South Africa. So how can he do that? Uh, Quinton de Kock needs to hit the ball, but when he and his partner are running, they should not complete the single. If they were to complete the single, then they would get the one run needed to win the game and he would end up on 99 not out and the match would conclude. So he would start running, but realize that the ball is going to the boundary and make sure that he does not complete the single before the ball crosses the boundary. So if he has not completed the single and the ball crosses the boundary, then four runs would be added to his total and to the team's total. He would end up on 102 runs and South Africa would win the match. I hope that scenario explains the law, Mohammed. Yes, yes, yes. It is. It is clear. And then uh, my second correction is: um, the, um, if if a side balls um, and se um, seven good balls um, instead of six, um, and what will be the uh, um, and the repercussion? Like, um, what will be the uh, uh, will the um and will there be any opportunity for the the next side like for for them also to ball seven overs or what what will you um what will be the umpire's um, decision there? Abdullah, do we make two wrongs to get a right? Uh, how do we handle having uh, allowed seven balls in an over? Yeah, yeah, uh, Mohammed. Uh, let me first start by saying it is of utmost importance that the 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 two on-field umpires, and if you do have a luxury to stand at provincial and international level, uh, including the TV umpire, that they make sure that six balls gets bowled in uh, in the over. Uh, Tom alluded to the fact that uh, if you if you are unsure. Um, yes, sometimes it won't look too good, but rather get your ball counting spot on. Don't be shy to ask the the scorers. It should be exception to the rule. It cannot be asking the scorer every single over, every single over, every uh, second over how many balls left. But that's a huge part of uh, and um, uh, of the umpire's job to get the ball counting um, spot on. But yes. The law uh, allows for umpire, and they do know umpires do make mistakes. It can happen. You can allow for a five ball over, uh, a seven ball over, an eight ball over. Shouldn't be the case, but the law allows for that. And the law knows that it, it, it happens from time to time. So what does the law tell us? So when it happens, when you, in your example, allows for a seven ball over to take place. That seven ball will count 
So any run scored off that ball will count towards the batting uh, side, towards the individual or the batter uh, on strike and towards the batting uh, team total. Similarly, any wickets taken off that ball will also count towards the, uh, the, the fielding side. So, yeah, if umpire made a mistake, umpire made a mistake. You'll allow the wickets that was taken off that ball and you'll allow uh, the runs. So now you cannot, uh, um, um, what's those words that you used, Tom? Make, make. Uh, two wrongs don't make two a wrongs, right. Two <laughs> wrongs don't make, don't make a right. So you cannot now, the, the, let's say the field, the now, uh, the captain comes to you saying, yeah, but umpire, um, you allowed a seventh ball over um, for, for side A. So now just to be consistent, please now allow for us a seven ball over as well. No, that cannot happen. It was a genuine mistake by the umpires. They didn't do it on purpose. It was an oversight. They didn't get the counting correct. So it was a mistake and they shouldn't have allowed the seven ball. Uh, but yeah, going forward, they're going to try to get the counting uh, spot on. Did I answer your question, Mohamed? Well noted. Yeah, yeah, it is clear. Well noted. Thank you. Okay. Over Tom. Thanks, Mohammed. Thanks, Abdullah. Next hand up is Alicia Bazedanot. Alicia, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Good evening, guys. Um, two quick ones. Uh, yeah. when when you watch uh, the cricket, you see the umpire when for lack of another word, the bouncer, he'll tap on his shoulder, say once. And then twice, uh, yes. And then the third ball, does that become a no ball? Or is Dilla, it... you want to take that one? So, um, so Alicia, there is, um, so yes, to answer your question, yes, and depending on the type of competition, but there are playing conditions for various co uh, competitions. Uh, yeah, uh, we currently, um, uh, having the IPL um, on TV, so well as mm. the Cricket South Africa T10, T20 T competition uh, with the semi-finals this week and the final um, uh, uh, on the weekend. So in, T in T20 competitions, uh, for most of the T20 competitions across the world, there is a playing condition in place that allows one bouncer and uh, if I can just briefly explain to what it's meant by a bouncer, you allowed one ball better standing upright at the popping crease for the ball to go be between shoulder and head height. Uh, uh. That is T20, you allowed one of those per over. So if you do bowl a second one in that over, the playing condition states, the second one needs to be called a no ball. Okay. So that is in T20, in 50 over, you allowed two these bounces per over the uh, bounces that a uh, ball that's allowed between shoulder and head height so in, in a 50 over competition the um the third one will now mm. be in that same over will now okay. be a no ball similarly to test cricket you also allow two per over with the third one being being um a no ball okay cool and then the other thing is it acceptable for an umpire to have a ball counter you know, the little handout ball, ball counters? Of, of a, course, <laughs> that is a huge part of our e okay. equipment. You okay. are a brave umpire if you go <laughs> <laughs> onto the field yeah. without a, a counter. I've actually encountered um, an umpire uh, many years ago. I went to a Cricket South Africa under 13 tournament and the umpire didn't come onto the field with any uh, equipment. Only the only piece of equipment he had with him was his hat. So I actually just, you know, during lunchtime, just ask him, um, you know, just for interesting <laughs> sake. I mean, I know umpires are different, but but how do you keep track of the balls? He said to me, no, no, I, I, I keep track of the balls. In my mind, I count the balls. Okay. So, so I mean, I didn't argue with him. That was his method. But yeah. but you can just imagine, uh, it was yes. a long day. It was in it was in Postestrom, South Africa. It was in December. It was close to 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. And and um, and yes, there were many overs, uh, especially if something happens. Like if a wicket falls mm. or you if uh, there was a wide, uh, then he gets distracted and mm. then I mean, we all get distracted. But I'm just yeah. saying that just compounded 
uh, he's counting, and then he was then he was lost. Yeah. So um, so uh, but, so so yeah. But that was an important part of the equipment. Yeah. It helps you keep track of mm. of the the ball counting. So that's your first protocol. Your partner is your second protocol at provincial and international level. We do have scoreboards, the TV umpire that can also help us with with the counting. So yes. You must go onto the field. I <laughs> okay. say it's uh, it's compulsory to to take the field with. We call it a clicker. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 But I must say, some of the umpires can hide that very well. You just see a slight movement of the hand. It's not that obvious to see it, you know. So yeah, sometimes it yeah. looks like they they just counting in their heads, but then you watch no, the no, hand. No, 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 no. You watch the you, hand. Yeah. They all they all have. We had Marie Rasmus last week, the best in the world. Yeah. I stood with him. He has a guy. He has a counter. Yeah. Um, all the umpires. I, I don't know of single umpire at international level, Tom, yes. that doesn't have a, <laughs> a clicker. Oh. Okay. Thank you, guys. Oh, yeah. You're welcome, Alicia. Over, Tom. Yeah. Just to add to that, Alicia, I think you might have seen those umpires with um, what they call sheep counters, which are a lot smaller than uh, a traditional clicker that you will find in a sports shop. Uh, oh, so okay. those, so those, so those you don't see easily without uh, looking in. So that's what hands. makes them look good, is those small mm. ones. <laughs> Correct. Okay. <laughs> Correct. Um, in lecture six, we will be going through a match preparation presentation, and that presentation contains all the equipment that an umpire should have with him or her on the field and also in their bag uh, during a match uh, to make sure that they are well equipped to officiate a game of cricket. So stay tuned for that. Thank you. Next, next hand up is uh, Deepak. Deepak, you may unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Thanks for great explanations earlier. So I was just thinking loud, so on that question earlier from someone else around 12 players on the field. Mm -hmm. So similar to like what we have in limited overs cricket that uh, we need to maintain the captain of the fielding side needs to maintain either four or five players inside the circle. Otherwise, it's a no ball. So that's an accountability that captain holds. So why can't we do that with 11 players as well? Dula, you want to take that one? Number of players on the field again? The, uh, I'm going to bring it back to the responsibility of the umpires. They need to make sure that there's 11 players on the field. They need to, if they do uh, stuff it up, uh, they need to take uh, accountability. And yes, there are playing conditions in place that governs uh, players in, uh, in the circle, but, but, uh, but I don't see the governing body putting in a playing condition stating that uh, it's the captain's responsibility to make sure that they have 12 um, living players on the field. And if they don't, you need uh, a, um, the umpires needs to uh, um, call and signal um, uh, noble. I don't see the governing body doing doing that. Uh, I, I believe I'm happy with the current playing condition or how it currently is. Umpires, it's their responsibility. And if they do... Uh, mess up, and it, it happened to me before. I was doing a junior game, and and with the juniors, so with the coaches allowing, um, they want to give everyone game time. So they'll let, let's say, John, you go uh, five overs. They will let Pete go off, uh, go on for five overs, and there was this up and down, up and uh, uh, giving everyone the opportunity to participate in the game, and as fate to have it. I was still young in my umpiring career, but I mean, it can happen. You don't need to be, be young or inexperienced. It can happen uh, where, yes, there were 12 on the field. And um, if, if the coaches didn't allude to it, so the opposing coach was shouting, umpires, 12 fielders uh, um, on the field. And then I counted, I'm like, oops. And then I asked the fielding captain to remove one of the players. So yes, yeah, it, it can happen. But but yeah, I um, uh, I put that responsibility on on the umpires. And it's part of our duties. I promise you, before the game starts, I make sure there's 11 players on the field. Uh, of, after a, um, a um, an interval interruption, we do similarly. We, we, we first, we actually count. 
we look, we count the amount of players on the field. Some do it more visibly than others. You'll, some, you'll see some umpires do one, two, three. I don't do it that visibly, but I just look uh, um, with my head around just to make sure that there are 11 players on, on the field. There are times so we are, we are at it where the captain just made a made a mistake. Um, injured player didn't go off. Uh, um, the replacement player didn't go off and and they had 12 on the field. Luckily, um, I picked it up, uh, brought it under the captain's uh, attention and the um, the extra fielder went off. Did I answer your question, Deepak? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Over Tom. Thanks, Deepak. Thanks, Abdullah. Next hand up is Sandeep. Sandeep, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Sandeep here. Um, there's no question here, though, but I just wanted to add to the previous uh, question related to a clicker or a ball counter. Uh, if we go, you know, if you go to the old school, um, umpires used to have either coins or marbles to count the balls. And if I'm not wrong, um, in the ICC umpire, uh, ICC panel, elite panel today, Ellingworth, he still uses coins um, to count the balls rather than a clicker. Uh, yeah, so, Sandeep, thanks for your input. Um, I, I I think you're right uh, because if I look at uh, Ray Inglingworth, he uh, sorry Richard Inglingworth, he does um, he doesn't seem to be holding a clicker. Uh, and he could well be uh, using coins. Uh, there's no law in cricket that says umpires need to count using a clicker or a counter. Um, they can use whatever they need to use, whatever they want to use. Uh, and some, like Abdullah mentioned, just count in their heads. Um, but whatever you find comfortable and easy to do, uh, that's how you should go about uh, counting. And very importantly, just make sure you are always communicating non-verbally with your partner as to how many balls are left in the over, and you shouldn't go wrong. If you disagree, ask the scorers to avoid any embarrassment. Those are all the hands up in the meeting room. I see Alicia has uh, added another question into the chat box. I'll give this one to you, Abdullah. Uh, is it the umpire's responsibility to point out to the fielding side uh, that the number of fielders on the leg side is too many or there are too many fielders outside of the fielding restriction circle? Or do you as an umpire simply call no ball due to the fielding restriction violation? Alicia? We get guided here by the International Cricket Council. They actually gave a directive where they informed uh, um, us, and what I mean by us, so at international level and at um, provincial level, the directive is we do not guide the captains, give them a hint in any way if there is a breach of too many on the leg side in 50 or 20 over cricket or not enough fielders uh, inside the circle in, if I can call it, white, white ball cricket. It is up to the fielding side, uh, the captain and, and the other 10 members of the side to make sure that they comply with enough fielders in the circle or no, um, not more than five on the, on the leg side. So... The, the directive is if we do pick it up, and that's why a huge part of the uh, um, on-field umpires' duties, including uh, at international and at, at provincial level, it's if we call it the player control team, the PCT, it's part of the TV umpire can also play a vital role, but it, but uh, but most of the responsibility uh, lies with on-field. Every single ball at international level, they do count. They make sure that. The um, the field in T complies with the regulation. So, uh, so every single ball, I, I taught myself that uh, that habit because yes, I got caught 
um, um, with my, um, I don't want to say with my pants down a few times, but I got caught out uh, a few times where, you know, you, you count, you count the beginning of the over and then you tend to relax and maybe another ball late in the over or two balls in the over. But on more than one occasion, I got caught out where there were, was not enough um, players inside uh, the circle. I then uh, spoke to one or two of the uh, international guys and they actually said to me, every single ball, because uh, as a ball, um, uh, uh, um, one ball, and, and if it's not enough people in the circle, uh, it is then a no ball, the playing condition states, if they don't have enough players in, in the circle or if there's more than five on the league side, uh, I'm part to call and signal no ball. So no ball, it's an extra ball, and in white ball cricket, it's a free hit as well. And in 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 the game these days, with these small margins, it can be the difference to a side lo- losing the game uh, or winning the game. So at international level, they actually count every single ball. So I try to get into that habit where I count every single ball. Um, so I do two counts. I make sure that there's enough on my first count is, um, make sure there's enough on the, on the uh, not more than five on the leg side. So what I do is I just count how many on the off side. So I make sure at all times my first count is I want to see four on the off side. And then my second count is the amount of fielders uh, inside uh, the circle. So I just count the amount inside the circle. Some some umpires count how many fielders uh, it's outside the circle. For me, it's much easier to count inside the circle. Uh, so those are the two counts, and I do it every single ball, or I try to do it every single ball, not to not to get caught out because there can be huge uh, repercussions. And and it happened to me as fate to have it. Uh, the side lost by one run. It was a provincial game. They lost by one run. And you can just imagine the uproar um, uh, of the, the lo- losing side. And uh, it, was a, it was a big thing. And, they, and it meant they didn't qualify for, for the playoffs. And uh, they wanted to go court cases. And it, it, it was huge. So I learned my lesson the hard way. And I, yeah, I now count every single ball. So to answer your, your question... No, we're not allowed to uh, to give the uh, fielding side any heads up. It's their responsibility. If they're not enough in the circle uh, or more than five on the leg side, you need to call and signal um, no ball. As I said, directive from the um, ICC. I do know at, at club level, um, uh, and Tom, you can come in here. We are a bit more relaxed. They are not professional. They are not pro, uh, professional players. So I'm just going to uh, uh, throw a pass the ball to you, Tom. So just at club level, because they 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 are not professional. Uh, where do we go? I know at Premier League level, uh, there's lots of uh, professional or or provincial players playing there. So I know at 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 our Premier League level, we also do not assist. But I know at lower leagues, mm. we do. So over to you, Tom. We how low do we go before we start assisting? Yeah, thanks, Dula. Um, what we do as umpires in Western Province Cricket Umpires Association um, for club cricket. We don't verbally assist uh, teams. Uh, what we do is if we spot a fielding restriction violation, uh, we simply put our arm out so that a bowler does not bowl the ball. And with our other hand, we will uh, make as if we are counting the fielders in the ring or on the leg side or on the off side. Uh, that is a hint to the fielding side to show them that their field needs correcting. Uh, If they do not see that hint or they do not know what to do with that hint, uh, then you put your arm down and you let them bowl and you call and signal no ball if the field is incorrect. Um, So we are indirectly trying to assist them, uh, but we do not um, say anything. Uh, Why? Because if we do assist in the morning but we miss it in the afternoon then we can be um accused of being um 
favoring one side or helping the one side but not helping the other. So if we've just got our arm out and we're just counting the fielders, uh, that shouldn't be construed as uh, helping the one side out. Um, so that is the process that we implement at club cricket level. Uh, at international level, Alicia, if you watched South Africa against uh, Sri Lanka woman, the third ODI last week, Wednesday in uh, Potchestrum, uh, South Africa were defending uh, 301 in 50 overs and Sri Lanka actually got it with 4.3 overs to spare. Um, in South Africa's rather disappointing bowling and fielding effort, they were pinged twice for having too many fielders outside of the fielding restriction circle. And so uh, our on-field umpires were very vigilant and uh, they communicated to each other via radio, but they have earpieces. So when they communicate to each other, the rest of the fielding team doesn't hear um, them speak. So the square leg or the striker's end umpire said uh, too many fielders outside the circle and the bowler's end umpire said, yes, you're right. And she allowed the delivery to be bold. And as the delivery was bold, um, the bowler's end umpire called and signaled no ball. So that is the process at the different levels. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Anessi missed uh, the response to our question earlier, Abdullah. If the seventh ball of an over takes a wicket, uh, what happens? Does the wicket count or do we cancel that delivery? Uh, Anessi? All wickets taken off the sea, or if a wicket gets taken off the seventh ball, it counts. All runs taken off the uh, scored off the seventh ball also counts. Yes, we made a we made a mistake. That's why it's important. We do need to get our counting spot on. But runs, all wickets, uh, runs get uh, scored, added towards the batter and the team total. Uh, similarly, wickets get added to the bowler. Over, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Last hand up, Sandeep. Just an extension to um, this quick question, Abdullah. And uh, if that seventh ball is a no ball, then and then after the no ball has been bowled, umpire realized that it was a seventh ball, we will not allow to have an extra delivery to cover that no ball. The over ends there and there itself. No free hit either. That is correct, Sandeep. The law guides us here. The law is actually very specific. The, the wording is in there where it says, if you do realize <laughs> that the seventh ball was not a legal, uh, the seventh ball, and even though the seventh ball is not a legal delivery, you will not, if you realize your mistake, that you will call uh, um, over, even if the seventh ball was a no ball. Correct, Sandeep. Thanks, Sandeep. Thanks, Abdullah. And thank you all for your attendance and your input this evening. Alexis has just added something into the chat box. Let me read it. If you should indirectly assist with field count at club level and the field numbers are not adjusted thereafter, followed by calling a no ball, is there a limit as to how many no balls can be given should the field not be adjusted accordingly? Abdullah, so we've got too many fielders outside of the fielding restriction circle. We call no ball. Uh, what do we do then? Uh, so, Lexi, so we, yes, we've picked it up and now we've called and signal uh, no ball. Um, the, uh, the fielding captain will look at you and ask you why. You'll tell the fielding captain it's because uh, not enough uh, fielders uh, in the circle. So the next one ball will then be, um, you will allow additional ball and the next ball will be a free hit. But you will also allow the fielding captain uh, to fix this error. So meaning you will allow the fielding captain 
to bring a fielder inside the circle. Because if you're not going to allow it, then every single ball of, after that will then be a no ball. I mean, we cannot have uh, unlimited amount of no balls. So the law allows or the playing condition allows for the error to be rectified. So you'll call no ball once. You'll tell the fielding captain will ask you why. You'll give you a reason. You will then allow the fielding captain to rectify the error by bringing then an um, an additional fielder inside the circle, which means the next ball will be a free hit. Yes, but then they'll they will then comply with enough fielders in the circle. Over, Tom. Thanks, Abdullah. And thank you all once again for your attendance and your interaction this evening or whatever time of the day it is in your time zone we shall reconvene again tomorrow same time same place different microsoft teams meeting link i will send that out tomorrow morning as well as the link of the recording of today's lecture so see you all tomorrow thank you once again Good night and goodbye. Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>